Hi everyone and welcome to our live event for the month of July. Again, we have the wonderful Heather Thomas here with us. We're going to be answering your questions for the next hour. Again, these are questions that you guys have submitted beforehand as well as any that you guys want to ask during this next hour live with us. You can do that by submitting questions uh, in the comment section under the video. Uh, so feel free to participate in our conversation and we're going to get started right away. We have a question here from Mary. And she wants to know, how do you line up a backing that has either lines or squares on it so it's evenly distributed around the edges? That's a really tough one. Um, my first response wants to be kind of snarky and say, don't use that fabric. Um, those fabrics are really tough to use as backings because there's a 99.9% .9 chance things are going to be crooked when you get finished. Um, everything shifts and moves during the, the quilting process. Um, starting with the idea that fabric is malleable, it, it moves, it shifts, it stretches, um, it's never going to be perfect. So I'm going to kind of backtrack on the question and say to you, if you're a perfectionist, meaning that you're going to be very unhappy if those lines and squares or that grid is not perfectly placed on the back, if that's going to make you really unhappy in your final piece, don't use that fabric. Use something that's got a wonderful all-over pattern on it or something like that or even something that's just simply mottled. If you're not a perfectionist and it doesn't bother you too much, go ahead and use it. And what you can do is when you go to lay your batting and your quilt top on top of that fabric, use your ruler and um, find that print from the back side of the fabric. So most fabrics you can see some of that print through it find a line or find a section of the grid that you can use as your um, your straight point and use that to make sure that your batting is on there straight and that your top is on there straight and then pin that line really really well when you lay that batting and that um, quilt top down and then when you go to the opposite side do the same thing find another line or a registration point that you can get really straight with your ruler and then pull that batting so that it lines up equally with that and pull that top so that it lines up equally with that and then your chances are going to be a little bit better at being straight however keep in mind that almost none of our fabrics these days are printed true to the grain it just doesn't happen so you might be straight in one area but when you get to another area it's no longer straight and there's nothing you can do to make it straight so that's why I say using those fabrics can be very, very difficult, um, especially for the perfectionist. And when you get done with your quilt, you should be happy and joyous, not ticked because the backing is not straight. So maybe you want to save that fabric for something else, make some pillowcases to go with the quilt or something, um, and use a backing fabric that's more forgiving. Okay? Absolutely. I'm all about anything that will help maximize uh, the end results looking good and looking the way you want it to. Yeah. Uh, we have another question that come, uh, came in just now, and it's also about backing fabric. And Agnes wants to know, when adding backing to a quilt, is it better to place the selvage edges against the sides of the quilt or against the top and the bottom of the quilt? This really doesn't matter. Um, it depends on how you're trying to get the biggest bang for your buck. If your quilt is only 70 inches wide, then you can get away with two widths of fabric. And so therefore your selvage edges are going to be on the outside sides, long sides of the quilt. Whereas if you're doing a king size quilt and you need to put your, your um, backing fabric in the opposite direction because you're going to take three widths to get that 90 or 100 um, inch width, then you're going to have those selvages running across the top and bottom. So it's more about um, getting the best bang for your buck when you're buying that $100 or so worth of backing fabric. The grit, the grain, whether it's the crosswise or the widthwise grain, isn't going to matter when it comes to that backing. What does matter is that you pull those selvages off. Make sure that there are no selvages on your backing fabric before you go to piece those um, backing fabric pieces together because they are wonky, so get them off, and um, then it doesn't really matter. Perfect. All right, we have another question that just came in also. Um, this is from Cynthia, and she says, when doing bias binding for mitered corners, do both the front and the back slant the same way? I'm never quite sure if I'm doing mine correctly. This might be kind of hard to answer if you can't show it. Yeah, but. it might be kind of hard. My first question is, um, why are you using bias binding? Um, and so I'm going to kind of backtrack that and make sure that 
the only reason to use bias binding ever is if you have a curved edge to your quilt. Otherwise, your best bet is to use binding that's cut on the straight of the grain. Um, and you want that the lengthwise grain if possible. The, the widthwise grain is fine too, but the, the, the lengthwise grain is your strongest grain of the fabric. Um, and it's going to give you a really nice flat edge with no rippling. If you put a bias binding on a straight edge of a quilt, there's a very good chance that you can pull that bias as you're putting it on and end up with a slightly rippled edge to your quilt. So that being said, I'm going to assume that you're putting it on a curved edge quilt um, and that you have some corners to that curved edge quilt. I'm not sure why you would because generally they would all be curves. Um, but if you do have corners, then if you're talking about um, when you're doing a double French binding, um, which I think that's what we all talk about when we say binding, it's the double sided binding that has the wrong sides pressed together so that we have the double binding usually cut from two inch strips or maybe two and a quarter or two and a half inch strips. That's a double French. Um, if you're worried about um, one of the uh, seams that you, that you use to sew your strips together landing on the corner, well that's something that you don't want to happen. You don't really want one of those seams to be on the corner. You want to make your own quarter corner by um, stitching a quarter inch um, away from the edge of that quilt um, and stitching until you get a quarter inch away from the end of that side of the quilt and then folding a miter up and then back and then stitching again and that's going to give you that built-in miter on the corner and so you don't want the miter to be in the stitching that's holding the strips of binding together you want this, the miter to be formed when you fold the binding physically up and back and then stitch it on. I hope that answers what you're asking. All right. Um, I, I think that was a pretty good explanation. Again, that's kind of a hard thing to explain if you can't see the actual. Sure. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Fine. Yeah. Um, our next question here is uh, about general quilting. Donna asks, when you're doing your quilting, how close to the edges should your quilting be? Uh, how they should go all the way to the edge. Um, it's really important that if if you have borders on your quilt, and most people do, that the borders be quilted with a density that is halfway between the most amount of quilting you have on your quilt and the least amount of quilting that you have on your quilt. Basically we say the density should be in the midline. So if you've got background areas of your quilt that's quilted every half inch, that's a pretty average size stipple, and you have foreground areas of your quilt that are stitched every inch or so, then halfway in between those two measurements would be three quarters of an inch meaning that the stitching in your border, the density or the closeness of the lines of the stitching should be approximately every three quarters of an inch. What this will do is it will kind of help the center of the quilt make sense between those two different amounts of quilting and it will tighten up that outside edge of the quilt, make it drape beautifully on a bed or hang really wonderfully on a wall. So yes, you must quilt all the way out to the edges of your quilt. Even if you only have a three inch border, that border needs to be quilted. Perfect. All right, I just want to remind anyone um, who's maybe just joining us that you can submit questions live for about the next hour. Again, do that by uh, entering any question you have in the comment section under this video. We're going to work our way through questions over the next hour. And I also want to let everyone know that we uh, are announcing the release of our new free download. And this is an ultimate sewing machine guide. And this is going to give you information about everything from what to think about when buying a machine, setting one up, cleaning, uh, taking care of it, basic use of the machine. So if you want to check that out, that's on our website and you can download that uh, free guide. Um, so moving on with our questions, our next question here comes from Shirley and she says that I love to make projects using half square triangles. However, they are not so square when I'm done and I have to cut them again. Um, is it my sewing method? What is, what is making them not come out square? Okay. Well, without seeing them, it's really hard for me to say but I'm, I'm going to kind of backtrack with you. I'm going to say that your, quarter, your half square triangle units can only be as good as the sewing. The sewing can only be as good as the marking and the marking can only be as good as the cutting. So everything goes back to that cutting. Are you cutting your squares? True. And then are you marking across the center of your squares diagonally? True. 
and are you sewing a true quarter of an inch away from that line on both sides? And then we get to the final and probably the most important part, and my guess is probably where things are going awry, is how are you pressing those half square triangles? So a lot of people don't press their blocks, they iron them. And they use that iron like it's a weapon rather than a tool. So what we want to do when we open up a half square triangle is if you put it so that the seam is up above you and that the point, the, the short fat point is pointing to you and you simply fold over the top half of that half square triangle block and with your two pointer fingers start in the middle where that seam is and finger press out to the two corners. Look at your block. Chances are it's pretty darn square looking. Then take your iron and simply set it down on that seam. Lift it up and set it away. Chances are your square is pretty square. But were you to take that iron and set it down that seam and push that seam, everything on the outside edge is going to start to move. You've got bias where that seam is and you're going to push that, even though it's got a stitch line in it, you're going to push that in either or both directions and you're going to make what was a square into something obtuse and weird looking. And then you're going to have to go back and do that, tri that trimming. From watching my students over all the years when they sew together half square triangle units, or any unit for that matter, where they do the most amount of damage is in the pressing. So my suggestion is ver press very carefully. Um, look at those squares before you press them and see you know, if they look really good. If they look really good, then that kind of tells you that pressing is the culprit. If that's not the culprit, then chances are you're not really um, using a, an accurate quarter inch seam. You're using a chunky one um, or you're having a very crooked seam. And that comes down to practice and sometimes you have to just sit and make a bunch of ugly half square triangle units or any other type of piecing until you really get that piecing um, accurate with that quarter inch seam. So practice does not necessarily make perfect but it certainly makes better. Absolutely and I think that's a good point to bring up between pressing and ironing because if somebody is just used to ironing they you know they think that's the motion they have to use yeah. so getting yeah. in your head that pressing is just pressing down, that's yeah. definitely, yeah. it takes a little bit to get used to it, but then, then mm -hmm. that should help out. All right, we have some more questions coming in, um, and Karen wants to know if muslin can be used uh, for backing any quilt. Absolutely. You can use anything you want on the back of the quilt that's included in the front of the quilt. Um, you could even use other things that aren't included in the front of the quilt when it comes to type of fabric. My question is, why are you going to, going to use muslin? Are you trying to save some money? Um, or are you trying to show off your quilting? Um, because that would be the only two reasons I could think of for using muslin. It's not all that pretty. Um, it's going to get dirty really quickly. Um, and it's going to show every single stitch. So if you are not a fabulous quilter, muslin's not the answer. If you want to show off some fabulous, amazing machine quilting, then muslin is probably not a, not a bad option. However, it tends to look cheap. So unless you're buying a very high-end muslin, which is going to cost you almost as much as a printed fabric, I probably wouldn't go with muslin. So to answer your question, yes, you can. But what I, which is what, not what you asked, but I'm going to throw my opinion in there anyway, I wouldn't. I wouldn't. I would use, you know, a solid if I had to. Um, but it's going to do the same thing. It's going to show every single mistake I make in the quilting. So I always tend to go with a fabric that's similar to one of the fabrics I use in the front of the quilt and something that's got at least some mottling in it, something in it that's going to say, um, oh, don't look at me, look at the front instead. <laughs> so, um, yeah, be careful with your selections of those backing fabrics um, because if you're going to have any issues with your machine quilting or your hand quilting, for that matter, chances are they're going to show more on the back than they do on the front. I could have used you years and years ago when I quilted my very first quilt and I used a pale purple uh, broadcloth and yes, you can see everything and my first quilt was not fabulous. So, yeah. <laughs> second that opinion. We've all done all right. that. <laughs> Our next question here is from Linda and she says, what types of batting do you recommend for best maneuverability for free motion writing or quilting? I feel as if I have no control and I'm wondering if this is my issue.
I lost you there for a minute. Oh, okay. Um, do you want me to do the whole question? She feels as though what? She feels as if she has no control, and she's wondering if, if the batting is her issue when it comes to maneuvering her quilt. No, the batting isn't your issue at all. In fact, we have this question coming up later, too, so I'm going to kind of uh, touch on it right now. Um, I would really love to know what kind of machine you're sewing on because that would probably help me with some information here. But what you're, what you're really um, having an issue with is how much space you have between your presser foot and the throat of your machine. And a lot of today's machines um, have a hovering foot instead of a hopping foot, meaning that the foot just hovers above the surface and you move the quilt around. Or they have a hopping foot that doesn't really quite hop like the old ones did with the, the um, strong um, springs in them. And you're not used to how much loosey-goosey space there is between the bottom of that presser foot and the base of your machine. And so it feels like things are just moving all over the place because they are moving all over the place. So my first suggestion to you is one of two things. If you can adjust your presser foot pressure, which is usually found on the left-hand upper portion of your machine, then I would tighten that pressure so that the presser foot is hitting that fabric when you're free motion quilting more often. If you can't, if your machine doesn't give you that option, then I highly suggest that you do not put down your feed dogs. If you leave your feed dogs up during the quilting, you will have a greater sense of control. They are not going to feed the quilt like they would during regular piecing because you're not going to have that constant contact with the presser foot bottom. That presser foot's still going to be either hovering or bouncing. And if those feed dogs are up, there's a little bit of, of teeth grabbed underneath there that helps keep that fabric of that quilt from feeling that it's just moving around and constantly while you're trying to manipulate it and maneuver it. So try one of those two things, in increasing your presser foot pressure if you can, or stitching with your feed dogs up, which is what I do all the time. Never drop them. That's, that's a good tip. I have, I have always thought, especially with free motion quilting, I, the first thing, I always thought you had to drop them, so it's good to know that you don't have to. Well, Ashley, there are some machines that will not machine quilt with them down, so it just depends on your machine. The fancier the machine, the more computer in there, the more that machine wants to tell you what to do instead of you telling it what to do. So you're going to run into machines that won't let you free motion quilt with the, with the feed dogs up. So, gotcha. Well, always good to keep your machine manual around then too. Also, so if you're having those kind of issues and you can't figure it out, go ahead and check that and see if that might be it. Yep. All right. Our next question here um, is from somebody who says they're thinking about taking up quilting. What are the first steps I should take to get started? Ah, uh, well, um, I used to say go buy a really good beginner quilting book. Alex Anderson, um, one of the grand dames of quilting, has some amazing beginner books out. And there are lots of other great beginner book titles, too. But these days, you can simply um, hook up on our website here at nationalquiltercircle.com and get a lot of beginner information. But you can also go to YouTube and say beginner quilting. You know, put that in and see what pops up. See the information that comes up. But no matter what, what you need is some good information. And then you need to practice that information. Because what a lot of people don't understand, they'll say, oh, well, I've been sewing my whole life. Well. Sewing your whole life is a lot different from accurate cutting with a rotary cutter <laughs> because that's where everything starts. And if your, your cutting isn't accurate with your rotary cutter, then your piecing isn't going to be very accurate. Then when you go to sew your blocks together, that's not going to feel very accurate. Then when you get done, you're going to have a bumpy, lumpy quilt and so on and so on. So, you know, starting at the very beginning, having some the, the proper tools for rotary cutting, um, practicing that rotary cutting with junky fabric, not with paper because paper doesn't give you the same feel, but some junky fabric that you feel like you can cut up. You can get a, your, your husband's old shirt or an old pair of jeans or whatever just to practice on. And then, you know, practicing that cutting and making sure that you're getting relatively accurate cutting. Doesn't mean everything has to be pinpoint perfect, but, you know, the more accurate the better. And then practicing using that quarter inch stitch. Remember that every pattern that you buy unless it says otherwise, whether it's a pattern in a book or a pattern that's a, a sold as a separate pattern, um, that designer based it on the quarter inch seam. So anytime your seam isn't a quarter inch, then you're going to ask 
different parts and pieces of the quilt to come together when they really can't because they're not the size they're supposed to be. So proper cutting and proper quarter inch sewing are kind of the, the um, two legs of a stool that build quilting and the final thing is going to be your pressing. Those three things are what is going to assure that you get um, units that you can sew together into a quilt, whether those units be something as simple as a four patch or a, a log cabin or a rail fence, which are all great beginner patterns. Um, accurate cutting, accurate quarter inch, accurate pressing. Um, so look for a book that, that um, or techniques online that address those three things and it's going to give you a great foundation. The final thing is go to your local quilt store, see if they offer classes, take a beginner class. It's going to be worth every penny you pay for it um, because that teacher will have lots of years of experience under her belt and be able to teach you lots of ticks, tri tips and tricks that you won't then have to make those same mistakes that she made before and um, hopefully jump ahead a lot faster. Absolutely, and I totally agree with um, practicing everything. I know one of the first things that I had trouble with, because I have a sewing background, was a rotary cutter. And it wasn't the rotary cutter, it was keeping the ruler from shifting. I would get all the way done with the cut, and at the very end, it would go one way or the other. And it's like that ruins the whole piece. So I'll actually, little, I'll little actually yeah, I'll be, I'll be shooting a video soon on how to properly cut, because it's one of, the, one of our most constantly asked questions. So we'll be having some more information about some of these basic skills coming up soon on the website. Perfect. Well, I can't wait to see that. <laughs> All right. Um, our next question, it kind of goes along with everything we were just talking about, but Shelby says she is new to quilting, long time sewing, and she wants to know what you sh would suggest as her first quilt. Ah, you know, I used to teach quilting all the time, and when I first started teaching, I, t I taught a four-week class that had pieced sections. Um, those piece sections came together as a center unit and had a pieced border, and then uh, after that it had applique on it. So I was teaching my students how to piece basic blocks and how to piece those into a basic unit, how to add borders to that unit that were pieced rather than just solid pieces of fabric, and then how to applique, which are, those are like the three things that we do constantly over and over again in one way or another with almost every quilt that we make. I know some people never do the applique because they say it's a four letter word, but those are great basic skills. So if you find a, a pattern that has a pieced area, a border area, and even some applique, that's a pattern that's going to teach you a lot. If you can't see a pattern that you think, oh, that looks like it might be what Heather's talking about, go with one of the absolute basics. Go with what's called a rail fence. It's just stripes. Stripes going in one direction, then the other direction, then one direction. Or a four patch, which is four equal size pieces of fabric in a block. Or a nine patch, nine equal size pieces of fabric in a block. Or a log cabin. Now a log cabin is harder than those other three and it gets redundant and boring to some people, but it's a great way to perfect strip cutting and sewing long pieces or long seams. Um, using an accurate quarter inch. So all of those are going to give you really great practice and you're going to be able to use some fun fabrics and get a feel for how you bring all those things together into making a nice quilt top. Absolutely, and I know we have a couple of, of those patterns actually in videos on uh, National Quilter Circle. I did one on rail fence as well as on nine patch. So we definitely have those resources available to you um, if you just go to uh, National Quilter Circle and check out all those videos there. Um, our next question here uh, comes from Paula, and she says, what is the best way to match seams when piecing? The best, best way to match seams, I'm assuming that what you're talking about is when you're sewing two blocks together, um, and you're talking about butting up your seams, your seams should be, when you're sewing two pieced blocks together, the seams should be ironed or pressed in the opposite directions so that when you bring those two blocks together those seams butt up to each other. Now one of the problems with um, sewing blocks together that a lot of people deal with is that is to pin or not to pin. And I believe in pinning, but I also believe that I should be able to leave those pins in when I'm sewing. And a lot of people have to take those pins out. And the reason they have to take those pins out is because they're using really big chunky pins that were they to sew over them and hit them with their needle, they could 
knock the timing out in their machine, which is not something anybody wants to do that doesn't have, you know, 300 bucks laying around to fix their machine with. So I highly suggest that instead of those big, big chunky pins that have the big yellow ends to them, that you invest about $10 in a package of very, very nice silk pins. And those silk pins are very thin, very long, very sharp. And you can sew over them with your machine. Now, I'm not telling you that your machine salesperson is going to agree with me. However, I've been doing this and I've been teaching this and I've been espousing this as a good idea for 15 years. And um, it works. So if you can leave those pins in, you're going to have a better chance at accurately sewing those two units together. Anytime you have to remove those pins, then you're going to have to do a lot more manipulation when you're piecing those two units together. What a lot of people don't realize, especially if they come from a garment making background, is that we're talking about lots of little units that mathematically are built to be sewn perfectly together to yield another unit. When we're sewing the seam of a, of a, a armpit, a, a sleeve into an armpit, we have lots of give. We generally have a, um, a bias area and we can pull and push and tuck and make it work. Whereas uh, sometimes there's not quite as much give when it comes to the piecing. However, get used to working any give in. So if you see something's not going to work, if you see one piece is smaller or big, bigger than the other, see what you can do to pull one to make it larger or to manipulate the other to make it smaller so that the two pieces do fit together before you sew them together and when you sew them together force them into fitting. You don't want to force them into fitting afterwards with the iron. You're going to totally misshape in that block. Um, it's called, uh, we, there's lots of wonderful names for it, but easing and stretching. And it is something that our quilt making mothers and grandmothers and great grandmothers have been doing forever. Um, easing and stretching. So remember who's the boss? You are. The fabric's not the boss, the sewing machine's not the boss, the rotary cutter's not the boss, none of those things are the boss, you're the boss. So take the initiative when you see something not working well, and either pull it apart and re-sew it, or ease it and stretch it so that it does fit, and you don't find yourself going, well, I'm just going to lop that off so that it does fit. Well, then your points are gone, or your thing is wonky when everything else isn't wonky, and so it looks goofy or whatever. But remember, you're, the, you're in charge, you're the boss. Um, and you're the one that gets to make that decision. Do I rip things out so that they might fit better? Or do I ease and stretch and make them fit before I sew them? Perfect. And I, you touched a little bit on this um, when you first started answering the question about uh, pressing in opposite directions, so like nesting those seams together. you want to explain what that means, too? Because that's a good way to get things to line up. Yeah, it's really important. So if I've got two blocks um, that are identical, and I know I'm going to be sewing, sewing them to each other, and um, they have uh, units in those blocks that are coming into each other. I want to make sure that one is pressed in one direction and one is pressed in the opposite direction so that when I bring those two blocks together, they're going to butt. So instead of um, them sitting right on top of each other, the seams, they're going to be next to each other like this. And the one seam is going to butt into the other seam. So they're going to have this overlap where the seam comes and one's going to be on one side and one's going to be the, on the other side and you can kind of feel where that just comes right into the middle and it's going to sit really nicely when you go to sew. If you have both of those seams flapped over on one side, you're going to have this big chunky thing happening and when you go to sew over that, your machine's going to do all this little and you're going to have a little granuncle in there where it's not a straight line and then you're going to look at your block and go, why isn't it perfect? It's not perfect because we didn't have butting seams. We need those seams to butt. So always think about, you know, you press one in this direction, one in that direction, so that when you bring them together, they'll butt. Perfect. Absolutely. All right. I just want to remind anyone, you know, we're about halfway through our live event. If you're just tuning in or even if you've been with us from the beginning and just following along, if you have any questions, feel free to submit those into the comment section below this video, and we will answer as many as possible. And I also want to remind everybody, again, that we just launched that new free download, that Ultimate Sewing Machine Guide. It has a lot of great information, so you definitely want to check that out. It's available on our website. Uh, I think you'll really love it. So moving on with our questions, we have one here from Eileen, and she says, if I use paper as part of an art quilt, 
do I need to preserve the paper in any way? And she would just like to hear you speak on incorporating paper into art quilts. Absolutely. I love to use paper in art quilts. Um, paper is a very strong fiber and um, it depends on how you're going to deal with it. If you're going to um, uh, make it dimensional and loose um, so that it's not tight down in the stitching, then it becomes a little bit more delicate. So in that case, I would finish it with some sort of finish, either a spray gloss or a spray mat or something like matte medium that I can paint on. However, generally when I use paper, I use it as though it's a piece of fabric. And so much of what I do is layering, 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 and I layer almost everything by sticking it down in place first with something like Misty Fuse. And I choose Misty Fuse, which is an, an iron-on adhesive, because it's so sheer and fine, and generally speaking, you can't see its um, structural grid underneath thin fabrics when you iron it down, whereas something like uh, steam a seam, you can see its its structural grid went through sheer fabrics and paper sometimes. So generally, I stick my paper down with Misty Fuse and I stitch through it. Now, because it's paper, I need to make sure that my stitch length is a little longer than what I would normally use with free motion quilting. If my stitch length is too short, I can it's actually like serrating that paper and it will just tear. So I want to make sure I have a bigger stitch length so that I'm not serrating that whole line of stitch and, and ending up with a tear in the paper. Um, but 99.9% .9 of the time when I'm done with a quilt that I've included paper in, I go back into that quilt and I use matte medium to put a very thin coat of protectant on top of that paper and um, make sure that it's got great longevity that way. So yes, use paper all you want. When you stitch on it, lengthen that stitch length. Um, and to be really smart and add life and longevity to your quilt, finish that paper with some sort of surface treatment. Perfect, and I think this would be a great time to talk about a new class that I know you have coming up on National Quilter Circle soon. It's your quilt assemblages class. And yeah. I know you, you use photos. I mean, I've seen you use paper towels and little, like, tea bags. I mean, all sorts of things. So that's all sort of paper products, and she covers everything in that class, and that one's coming out soon. So definitely yeah. check that one out if you want to see anything. It's a, it's a really, really fun one. And she makes some awesome stuff, that one. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Our next question here comes from Paula, and she wants to know what thread you recommend for piecing. What weight for both top and bottom? Okay. So for piecing, I'm a 50-weight girl. Um, you can use a thinner weight in the bobbin, like a 60-weight. Don't go more than about 10 uh, a difference in that weight. Um, most machines don't like it, number one, and it looks too weird, number two. The only reason to go thinner in your bobbin is because you'll just get more thread on your bobbin, so you're changing your bobbin less. Um, I would match those thread colors no matter what, because um, then you don't have to worry about, you know, is this absolutely perfect when it comes to the tension. Um, but 50 weight is a very nice, sturdy weight. However, not all 50 weights are created equal because some 50 weight threads are 3 ply and some are 2 ply. Now 50 weight talks about its tensile strength and they should all be about the same strength if they say 50 weight. However, Aurafil is a 2 ply 50 weight thread, nice and strong, much thinner than a Mettler 50 weight thread. I love to use both, but I tend to use more Mettler in my quilting and more fill in my piecing. And the reason I like it for piecing is because it's so much thinner. Yes, it's the same strength. One would not think that that thread could make a difference in your seam line, but it can. And so the thinner the thread, the more flat you're going to be able to press that seam and the more, I hate to use the term, but perfectly your units are going to fit together. So my favorite brand is Arafil for piecing. My weight is 50. My favorite brand for quilting is usually um, the Mettler and 50 weight for quilting too. So that's my opinion. Perfect. All right, our next question uh, just came in um, and she wants, Kathy wants to know if you ever use open seams in a quilt. Yes, absolutely. There are times when um, you can only use an open seam. If you've got so many seams coming together, say in the center of an eight-pointed star, you can do this little twist where 
almost all of them get twisted so that they're they're all being pressed against each away from each other but the final one you have to kind of open up otherwise you end up with a big lump in the center um, is it the best thing no because let's face it when we open up a seam I have to put my hands up here when we open up a seam and everything gets folded this way the only thing holding that seam together are those fine little threads that are stitched across whereas when we press a seam in one direction, we've got that whole second piece of fabric going over there and protecting that seam line. So can it be done? Yes. Are there times when you have really no other options? Yes. The difference is, is how you finish that quilt. I know if I've got a whole bunch of open seams in my quilt, then I need to quilt very heavily over those open seams. And if I do, then I'm going to be fine. But if I have a bunch of open seams in an area where I'm not quilting at all, I'm asking for big trouble because those seams can pop. So if you're going to use open seams because you feel like you have no other option, I understand because some of our wonderful, fabulous designs, we can't find another option. Make sure that you quilt those areas heavily. Awesome. All right, our next question here comes from Marcy. and She says, I'm new to quilting, but I want to make a t-shirt quilt. What kind of stabilizer would you recommend? Okay, a lightweight permanent, iron-on, non-woven stabilizer. So that's four things to think about. Lightweight, because we don't want it to be heavy. Iron-on, meaning that we're going to iron it in place. It's permanent. We're not going to remove it later. And um, non-woven. The reason we want non-woven is because we want the adhesive, basically, and the fabric itself to be sprayed out, if you will. Um, that way it's going to hold everything very equally. If it's woven, if woven fabrics have a stronger strength in their lengthwise grain and a weaker strength in their crosswise grain. And they can be manipulated. They're built to be manipulated to drape and do all that stuff. But what we're trying to do is to keep those t-shirts from doing any of that draping. We want them to become a little heft heftier, stiffer. We want them to behave more like a cotton fabric that we use in quilting. So a non-woven stabilizer is the most important thing of all of those things. So very thin. Um, uh, you can. It's going to run you like a dollar twenty-nine a yard. It, that's how thin and uh, basically cheap it is. What we're asking it to do is just hold things still for us while we're cutting and piecing. Perfect. All right, our next question here, now I'm not entirely sure if I understand how this question is, so um, if this is your question and I'm asking it wrong, please give me more information. But they say they have a quilt that their great-grandmother made, and they would like to trace the fabric to get an idea of how it was made. So I'm thinking they want to make a pattern off of this quilt. Do you have any uh -huh. recommendations for how to do that? Well, I think their idea of tracing it is a very, very good idea. And I'm going to go back to my original quilt-making story. Um, when I was... Uh, pregnant with my first child. I was 23 and I went to my grandmother who was what I now know as a junk quilter. All she used was, used was old fabric and old stuff to quilt with. Um, she said she had some patterns that I could use if I wanted to learn to quilt and I asked, him where, asked her where they were and she told me they were in the bottom drawer of the guest bedroom and I went in there and I couldn't find anything because I was expecting a written pattern, you know. And I went out and I said, oh there are these kind of ratty looking piece together blocks in there. She goes, those are the patterns. And so I brought them all out and there were nine of them and she's, I said, well, what do I do with them? And she said, well, you know, you, you look at them, you measure them, you figure out what, what made them and you, you know, add, a, you add your half inch for your seam allowance and you go and make it. And I was like, ah, isn't there a book? <laughs> And I did find a book later, but that was my original journey in quilt making. And one of those blocks was um, a very difficult block. So I'm going to use it as an example since I don't know what this person's quilt block looks like. But it was um, what we what we now call a Tin Man block. So it looked like the Tin Man sort of from um, Yellow Brick Road from uh, the movie. Um, and uh, it was quite difficult. It had like 18 different pieces in it. And so I did exactly what you're, what you're, you're, you're suggesting. Is I set a piece of paper down on it, and I basically traced where the, the seams were and used that as a guide. And then I measured each of those sections. And if a section you know, was three inches square, I would write it in my trace design that that section was three inches square. If another section was one inch by a half inch, I'd write that in the other portion that was where I traced. 
And then I went back in, and this is what we always do when we're designing, is we work with the finished size first of every unit, and then we go back in and add our seam allowance for cutting, which simply means that we add a half inch to the length and the width. So I could tell exactly how big to cut every single portion of that block from my little trace design and then the, the, the um, sizes that I put into each of those sections simply by adding a half inch to the cutting knowing that when I quilted, uh, pieced it together I would lose that half inch and my piece would go back to that size that I had measured. So I think that's a great idea. Trace that puppy, get out your ruler, do some measuring, make sure that you add that half inch for your seam allowances back in and see what you come up with. Perfect. Great. And I think, I, again, I think it's a great idea. I definitely have traced a few patterns and used those as well. So I hope that's what you meant. And again, if not, go ahead and re-ask the question and we'll answer it again if we have time. Our next question here comes from Pamela and she says that she has a double size quilt and she wants to know if she could remove the binding and borders and add more borders to make the quilt larger. Well, you can. Um, are, you, are you saying it's a quilt top or a quilt? Um, I'm assuming it's a quilt since you said there has binding on it. So um, you're going to have to add to the back batting and backing also though. So I'm going to kind of run you through how you would do this. So if you take the binding off, which uh, if you're smart you'll just cut the binding off rather than hands take it off because you're only going to use lose a quarter of an inch of that border that you may or may not use later. Take that border off. Um, then you're, and you're going to be I assume cutting off the backing and the batting that goes with those because otherwise you'd have to be ripping all the stitching out and that would be kind of a pain. So once you've done that you need to make sure that you have a quarter inch of backing and batting available to you around the whole edge of that center part of that quilt. So you will have to take out any quilting that's in there. Um, and then you're going to have to sew on two sides of excess backing and then the top and bottom of excess backing and you're going to have to sew on batting. Now batting you do not sew on by overlapping. You, you butt the batting together and sew it together with a zigzag, a very wide spread out zigzag. Because um, if you overlap your batting you're going to have a, a big long line of lump in your batting. You don't want that to happen. Once that's done then you can sew on whatever you need to sew on, your excerpt borders and so on, and then go back and requilt those areas. But I'm going to say the same thing to you that I said in the very beginning when I was talking to the lady who had the stripes and the, and the grid for her backing fabric. Why? Leave this wonderful quilt alone or this boring quilt alone or this quilt that isn't doing what you need it to do alone and just start another one. You know, make it the size that you want it to be because it would probably take less time than it's going to take to rebuild this original quilt. Um, you know, let sleeping dogs lie and go get another dog. You know, I, I just think you might have more fun that way. <laughs> Absolutely. And I mean, maybe if it's a pattern or something that you like, reuse that same pattern and yeah. make it look yeah. just like it, only bigger. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Our next question here comes from Jackie. And she says, I just made my first crazy quilt using different shades of green and royal purple. And she wants to know, should I pick one form of embellishment, like beads or button or embroidery, or just use them all? Uh, I say three. Three. Um, anytime anybody's doing any type of embellishing, my first book was on embellishing, um, anytime you're embellishing, whether it's a crazy quilt or some other type of quilt or a quilt that you wouldn't say anything other than it's just a quilt and I want to embellish it, I always say three. And the reason three is if you use more than three, it's too much. If you use two, uh, two is an even number and it's never all that pleasant. And one probably isn't going to give you the bang and make it feel like it's been embellished. So. I say if I'm going to do three then I'll, I'll choose three things that I really like. So let's say I like beading and I'm, but I'm only going to use one kind of basic style of bead. I'm not going to use 13 million different types of beads. I'm going to use one basic type of bead. Maybe I'm going to use seed beads but in lots of different sizes. Or I'm going to use just bugle beads in lots of different colors and lengths. Um, so I say beads and then I'm going to do the embroidery um, but I'm going to keep the embroidery all about the same colors not going to use every color under the sun, not going to use some shiny embroidery threads and some matte embroidery threads. I'm going to find a way to keep that kind of unified also. And then I'm, maybe I'm going to use charms and the charms are all going to be pewter. So I've got three different things but I build unity within each of those things. 
So let's do the opposite. Let's say I'm going to do the same three things. I'm going to use beads, and I'm going to use embroidery, and I'm going to use charms. But my charms are big and small and, and glass and pewter and plastic, and my beads are every type of bead you can imagine, and my embroidery is done in this thread and that thread and the other thread and all these different things. I'm going to end up with chaos on the surface of my quilt. Go back to the original idea. I'm going to use those beads. I'm going to use that embroidery, and I'm going to use charms. But all of my charms are going to be somewhat similar. They're all pewter. All of my beads are going to be somewhat similar. They're all bugle beads. And then all of my embroidery is going to be somewhat similar. I'm going to use nothing but rayon boucle to use in my embroidery. So I can do lots of different things with those things, but I'm going to have unity. Because design is based on this wonderful three steps of unity, variety, and balance. And it's much easier to balance three different things than it is to balance 18 different things. And it's much easier to bring unity into something when I repeat something. And I've already got the variety because I decided I was going to have three different embellishments. So unity, variety, and balance. And you're going to have a beautiful, beautiful crazy quilt. And I just want to say that I absolutely expect to see that crazy quilt when it's done because that question came from my mom. And I'm very excited that she participated in our live event. And I also want to say to anyone else out there that is uh, wanting to do anything with sort of beading or embellishing that Heather's got a lot of great videos um, on National Quilter Circle about adding beading and adding embroidery and all sorts of stuff and how to make the beads match with the print of fabric you have and all of that. So tons of resources out there for how to do that. Um, all right, our next question uh, comes from Carolyn, and she says, how do you calculate the size for a half square triangle when you are trying to enlarge a block using triangles rather than strips? Okay, I think I understand the question. So if I'm making a friendship star, which has a solid block in the middle, and a solid block in the four corners, and then between the four corners it's got half square triangles that make up the star tips. So those are my half square triangle units. And she wants to enlarge that is what she said, right? Yes, and there's a second part to this question. I can okay. add that in now. She says, I have an existing star block that I need to make larger to fit into a border. I want to put the existing block on point and make it fit to the width of the border. Ah, you're going to put it on point. Okay. Yeah, okay. So you want to you you need to know that diagonal width which is going to be bigger than its 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 width across the the middle or in going either directions. Let's go back to making that square bigger first and then I'll talk to you about how you're going to decide how big things need to be. Um so your center width, when you go on the diagonal, just like your television, you know, you buy a television and it's a 40-inch TV and you get home and you're like, no, it's not. It's only 36 inches. Well, they measured that across the diagonal. The diagonal is 40 inches. Um, and so you do have a 40-inch TV. It's just 40 inches on the diagonal. So you do feel shorted of it. That diagonal was always going to be longer. So my first thing is, is determine how big you want that diagonal to be. So if you need the diagonal to be 8 inches because you want an 8 inch border, then you need to know how big that block actually is if it's got an 8 inch diagonal. Now I don't know the math on that right now. Um, I would have to look at my ruler because that's what I do is I look at my ruler that has a diagonal line across it and I move up 8 inches on that diagonal and then I find out what the square is where that 8 inches comes to. So that's what I would do. That being said, you need to look at your block and how your block is made. Is your block a nine patch? Now you're saying it's a star. Well, stars are either nine patches or twelve patches, meaning it's made from either twelve equally sized units, four by four, or three equally sized units, three by three. So if it's a nine patch, then I need to make sure that my number that I'm using for the outside edge of my square is an odd number. I want a 9 inch square or a 12 inch square or you know I don't want an even number basically I want you to be able to divide 3 into it and I can use 6 because I can divide 3 in that but I can't divide 3 into 10 equally and if I have to do that division I'm going to end up making cuts that are 5 eighths of an inch and 3 eighths of an inch and my accuracy is going to go to heck in a handbasket. So that's your first thing is if, if my block is a uh, a nine patch, 
then I want to be able to make either a 6 inch block or a 9 inch block or a 12 inch block, something that is equally divisible by 3. If my block is a 12 patch, then what divides equally into 12? I could do 2 inch units, I can do 4 inch units, I can do 6 inch units, and therefore I'm going to me measure, so if it's 2 inch units, 2 times 4 is 8. I can do an 8 inch block. Um, so that's one of the things that you need to know. The basics of block building are very important when you're doing your own designs and if you don't understand how a block comes together then the math can become a veritable nightmare. Um, so your first goal is you know how big is that block? Then simply whatever the corner unit is, so if it's a nine patch block that makes up that star and you want it to be nine inches then that means those corner squares are each going to be three inches finished. You always work with the finished size. So we have three inch finished squares because we have three and then the half square unit is going to be three inches finished and then the other square is going to be three inches. Those three together equals nine. So all we have to do is add seven eighths of an inch to our cut when we layer two fabrics together to make that star tip. The star tip fabric color and the background fabric color so instead of cutting them three and a half, like we're going to cut our corner units, we're going to cut them three and seven eighths, so, uh, mark a diagonal line across the, the middle, and sew on either side a quarter inch away, and that will yield two half square triangle units. And we'll have to do that twice to have all four units. So the simple answer to that very long question is add seven eighths of an inch to whatever it is you're cutting um, or your finished corner block unit is going to be. So if it was cut three and a half, that's because it's going to be three finished. So you'd be adding three and seven eight or seven eighths inch to that, which would be three and seven eighths. But study that block and understand how it's built. <laughs> Absolutely, and sometimes there, there really just is no easy answer for a question. Like right. you just, you really yeah. have to kind of get into it and see how it all comes together to work your way out to the answer. Yep. All right, so we're we're coming, you know, kind of towards the end of our live event here. So there's a few things I want to remind everybody of. Again, you can always submit your questions under these videos, and we'll keep answering them um, for a little while here. Uh, but if you don't get your question in, you can always uh, submit questions to us on our website. We'll, we'll still get those questions emailed to us, and we're going to still work on answering your questions anytime you have them. You can connect with us on our website, on social media, Facebook, Pinterest, Twitter. Um, and we also want to encourage you to download uh, our new PDF. It's our ultimate sewing machine guide. It has all sorts of information for how to choose a sewing machine, how to set one up, how to clean it, care for it, and how to do basic changes like changing settings, adjusting tension, all that kind of stuff. So you can download that on our website. I think you'll really enjoy it. So a few more questions that just got submitted here. And Michelle says, I have a quilt top that was my great grandmother's. The seams are hand done and not really secure. Should I mis machine stitch it before I finish it? Oh, how do you plan on finishing it? Are you going to hand quilt it or are you going to machine quilt it? Um, yes, go back and redo the seams if you're going to hand quilt it. No, do not redo the seams if you're going to machine quilt it, but machine quilt it very heavily and make sure that your machine quilting does what I almost never want my machine quilting to do. Make sure that it goes over your seams in the piecing. So a nice all-over patterning in your machine quilting that's relatively tight together is going to hold all those loose seams together. And I do mean relatively close, like every quarter inch to half of an inch. Um, and then plan on not using that quilt a lot. Plan on that quilt being the quilt that my great-grandmother or grandmother piece and I quilted and it goes on the back of the couch and no, you do not get to eat your peanut butter sandwich next to it. And you're not going to launder it a whole lot. It becomes an heirloom piece that is there to look beautiful and have a wonderful warm heart string story to go with it, um, but you're not going to use it a ton. Either way, even if you go back and redo all those seams, um, because of the age of the fabric, because of the fact that it's probably dirty, there's probably all kinds of skin and all kinds of stuff stuck inside that fabric that makes it want to fall apart. Um, and that's the other thing. I would very gently launder it once when I'm done to try to get the bulk of all that gunk out of there, even if it was stored you know, nicely, um, that stuff is dirty. Um, so don't plan on using it a lot. Plan on keeping it as a family heirloom and um, using it gently and either redo those seams for hand quilting or leave them as is and 
consider heavy machine quilting. Perfect. All right, and another question just came in here. Um, Gay asks, do you use starch, uh, and if so, when and what kind? Uh, well, um, I used to use a lot of starch when I did a lot of applique. Um, and uh, I'm going to give a little warning out there to the hand appliqueers of the world. Um, be prepared as you get older. If you continue to hand applique, you're going to have to have your hands worked on. <laughs> um, I've been having my hands worked on a lot lately because of hand applique. I love to hand applique, but I got to the point where I couldn't do it anymore. Um, it's very hard on the hands. And so if, you're, if you love to applique like I do, Go easy on it. Don't do it 12 hours a day every day, um, no matter how much fun you have with it. I know a lot of you are out there going, fun with applique? Yeah, it could be a lot of fun. Um, yes, I use starch when I applique because I did the starch and press method where I put starch in the outside um, seam allowance and press it over either a piece of hard paper or watercolor paper or um, a ironable mylar or something. Uh, I think that you're asking those, do I use starch when I piece? And um, yes, I used to when I did a lot of heavy piecing. I did a lot of starching because I like my, my fabric to behave the way it did before I washed it. And yes, I pre-washed. So um, yes, I used starch. Um, I used faultless spray starch. Um, uh, the liquid starch that comes uh, in the gallon container, and I would put it in my own spray bottle, mixed with water. Um, I don't remember what the the exact measurements were um, listed on the bottle. I know that I thinned mine a little bit more than they said to thin it, and I liked it better that way. Remember that if you overheat your fabric while you have starch on it, it will turn brown. It's not permanent, but it has to be laundered out. Um, starch is exactly what it says it is. It's starch, and it attracts bugs. So, if you're going to use starch, you must launder your quilt when you're finished quilting it. So, if you have no intention of, of laundering your finished pieces, then you have got to not use starch because it will attract moths and other cloth-eating bugs. That's good to know. I never knew that starch did that. Yeah. I think I might shy away from starch now. Yeah. <laughs> All right, another question here from Marcy, and she wants to know what kind of fabric is best to embroider on. A loose weave. <laughs> so um, any fabric that's not a batik, batiks are really, really hard to hand stitch through. You don't want to hand quilt through them even. They're, they're just tough because they're so tightly woven. So you're lo looking for a looser weave. Now I'm not trying to dog any fabric designers or makers here, but um, there are some brands or houses of fabric that use a loose, more loosely woven gray goods, and that's the goods, that's the fabric before it's been printed on. And one of those houses is Moda. Moda tends to have a looser weave than a lot of the other fabrics out there. That simply means they have less threads per inch um, when the fabric is woven. And um, so generally a Moda is a great fabric to, to embroider on. So basically, if the fabric will fray easily, it will embroider beautifully. <laughs> um, so just nothing too tight. Um, just look for fabrics. That's why a lot of people used to embroider on muslin. They do the red work on muslin because it was mo more loosely woven. Linen is beautiful for embroidery, absolutely beautiful embroidery because it has a looser weave. So it's easier to needle. Absolutely. All right, we're almost to the end here, but we have one new question that just came in, uh, and that's from Sue. And she asks, how do I get the wrinkles out of a binding that's iron-on? I've never heard of an iron-on binding, so if you have, I'm really excited to hear about this. <laughs> I've heard of iron. I've, I've made many of my own iron-on bindings, and I believe you can buy iron-on binding these days. Yeah. Um, so I'm assuming you've 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 pressed the the binding onto the quilt, and during the pressing, you pressed in a couple of wrinkles. Um, well, as much as I hate to say it, you're kind of stuck. Um, you can try to lift that binding off, and almost every iron-on adhesive can be lifted off for at least a few hours after you've put it on by reheating it and softening that iron-on adhesive. Um, but if you heated it to the proper temperature that it needed to be heated to to be entirely adhered, then that adhesive would um, have, have kind of taken those two layers together and made them act as one, and you're never going to get that to happen again. So you'll need to get rid of that portion of the iron-on binding and use another portion where you took it off because it's never going to adhere well again. Um, 
uh, you could stitch over it with some decorative stitching and hide some of them. You could um, set the whole quilt aside for a day or two and then see how fast you can find those wrinkles in that binding to see if it really matters at all because chances are it doesn't um, because we get really caught up on the one little thing that we think is ah, horrible on our piece and people can't even find it. And I've always said and if your friends can find it then maybe they're not your friends. Um, so uh, sometimes we just stress out about these things but yeah if it's your competition quilt that you're planning on entering in a show or in a sh you know if, or if it's you're giving it to your mother-in-law who doesn't necessarily think you're fabulous but you want her to then you might want to get that wrinkle out so you can try to remove that binding and put a new portion on you can try to iron that binding and stretch out that wrinkle um, or you can try to cover that up with some sort of stitching but unless I really saw it I can't say this is exactly what I would do sorry this is why I absolutely love doing these with you because I always learn something new. I never thought of iron on binding. I don't know why, but I just I never thought of it. So that's Laura, Will, Laura Wizelowski is the queen of iron on bindings. All her quilts have iron on bindings. Yeah. See, now I'm gonna have to do some more research. So that's again why we love having you guys join us on these live events. Also, because we learn stuff. I learn stuff from you guys too. So definitely, we want you to keep tuning in. We do these every month. So check on on the website on social media. We'll always advertise when these are going to happen so you can uh, tune in again submit your questions ahead of time if you want to or just join us live and ask them then but we really appreciate everybody who joined us tonight we definitely we made our way through a lot of questions thank you so much Heather uh, for all your me. lovely insights absolutely and again just want to remind everybody again about that free machine download uh, machine guide download you can get it on our website check that out and keep in touch with us between now and our next live event on social media, Facebook, Pinterest, Twitter. We'd love to hear from you. Uh, always love hearing from you, and we hope to see you again next month. So thank you so much, everyone, and have a good night. All right, bye.